Hey guys, welcome back. So lately my channel's been focused primarily on this desktop 3D printed machine I've been developing, the Gumball. I still have so many more conversions and attachments planned, so this project is nowhere near finished. But I thought it would be fun to occasionally take a break and film some of the projects I'm making where I'm using the machine to hopefully maybe demonstrate its versatility and give you guys some ideas. So that's what this video is going to be. But because this specific project is so different from what I normally do, I felt it needed an explanation. So it's spring now and the weather's starting to get nice and I've been thinking a lot about what I want to do this summer. There's this hobby I've always been interested in, it's called FPV flying. If you've never heard of it, FPV stands for first person view. And it's a hobby where quadcopter pilots strap these tiny cameras onto their drones and with the help of these special goggles, they're able to see what the drone sees in real time. This allows a pilot to not only control the drone, but more accurately, it's like you're sitting in the pilot's seat. It gives you the sensation of flying and allows you to precisely control the drone, even when it's out of your field of view, and even when it's too far to even see anymore. This is something I've never done, so I've been spending a lot of time researching what I'm going to need to get started. And during my research, I came across this report on how Ukraine has been using homemade FPV drones as low-cost, improvised smart bombs. You see, Ukraine has been struggling lately to secure additional funding from the United States. And it's been forced to try and fill some of these gaps themselves. See, until now, if a Ukrainian soldier wanted to take out, say, a Russian tank, he would have used a U.S.-made Javelin missile, for example but they cost around $175,000 each, and their supply of donated missiles is running dangerously low. With additional funding stuck in Congress, there's no guarantee they're even gonna get any more. This has forced them to get a little creative, and so they turn to their local FPV hobbyist community, and what they've been able to accomplish on a shoestring budget is incredible. They're using modified consumer drones purchased off of Amazon, and after strapping them with high explosives, they become improvised smart bombs with dangerous precision. They can drop a grenade into a trench or fly kamikaze style right into the hatch of an enemy tank from over a mile away. What they can achieve with a $500 drone is nothing short of a miracle, but these low-cost drones do come with some serious limitations. Their small size limits the explosive payload they can carry. Another drawback is range. The range on these consumer grade drones is limited to maybe a mile or two tops, and Russia's begun employing more signal jammers, which drastically reduces the effective range even more. So unless Ukraine can solve some of these problems, their early advantage using drone warfare may be coming to an end. Almost immediately after watching the Ukraine video, the YouTube algorithm suggested another video by a channel called RC Test Flight which would ultimately become the inspiration for this project. In that video, he created what he calls the world's fastest RC tracked vehicle. And man, is this thing cool. It's basically a little radio controlled snowcat that he developed and ultimately he launched a Kickstarter where he sold kits so you could build your own. I'm sure it was because I had just finished watching the Ukraine video, but when I saw his creation, I didn't see a snowcat or a toy. What I saw was a weapon. And with some modifications, I imagined it could function sort of like a modern-day version of the World War II-era Goliath tracked mine, and possibly the answer to some of Ukraine's problems. So let's talk about what we need to change and what I imagine this thing being able to do. The original Snowcat sold on Kickstarter was a combination of, I believe, a bunch of custom machined parts, 100 injection molded track links, and some off-the-shelf components, but the bulk of the machine was intended to be 3D printed, which is far from ideal. The amount of custom parts and the large size of these parts all meant the machine would take forever to print, like over a month. That's not going to work. If Ukraine is going to have any chance of overwhelming Russia, they'll need to make a lot of drones. So a month isn't going to cut it. We need to cut manufacturing time for this thing from a month down to a single day. The only way to feasibly achieve this is to ditch 3D printing. It's just too slow of a process. Instead, we're going to go with laser. Laser cutting is much faster, but it also comes with some additional benefits that I'll explain in a minute. By the way, if you want to follow along and try making one of these yourself, but you don't have a laser cutter, you still can. I intentionally made the files as simple as possible, so you could actually make one of these with just a jigsaw and a cordless drill. You see, ease of manufacture is going to be an important goal here. And it's not because Ukraine lacks engineers or the facilities required for more complex manufacturing. It's actually quite the opposite. 
Since the war started, Ukraine has become a world leader in the manufacture of high-end drones and unmanned vehicles, like the Magora V5, it's an autonomous kamikaze boat, which has been absolutely destroying Russia's Black Sea fleet recently. So yeah, they have plenty of engineers, but they're busy working on dozens of high-tech, groundbreaking projects. I remember when Russia first invaded, I was awestruck at the bravery, resolve, and just sheer determination of average, everyday Ukrainians. I remember this story about a brewery in Kyiv that stopped making craft beer and started making Molotov cocktails to be distributed to the Ukrainian Territorial Defense Force. That was their volunteer militia. They were even teaching a class for locals on how they could convert garbage into firebombs at home. And thousands of people signed up. This is before they realized how useless Molotov cocktails are in modern warfare, but seeing how determined they were to fight was really inspirational. And so I imagine this project being in the same spirit, something that can be assembled and operated by ordinary Ukrainians without any engineering experience, or maybe a way for women or older men who are unsuitable for combat duty to contribute something meaningful, something like a Molotov cocktail for our generation. Only this has the potential to be effective. And like the Molotov cocktail, you'll be able to assemble one from literal garbage. All right, let's get started. I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna make it. And throughout the video, I'll explain how I imagine it being used. All right, so we're gonna start with quarter inch sheet material. What you use is ultimately up to you. You could use almost any scrap material. Goal number one was anyone could make it. So goal number two is that it could be made from almost anything. Let's imagine a worst case scenario, right? The Russians have you surrounded. Your supply lines are completely cut off almost Everything required to make one of these can be either found off the shelf at Home Depot or salvaged from a junkyard. Some options would be plywood, MDF, acrylic, PVC, polycarbonate. In my case, I'm going to go with acrylic. This is the file we're going to be cutting, and we'll be cutting two of everything. As you can see, there are some areas here in the design that I'll be laser etching in some recesses around some holes. This is completely unnecessary, and you can skip this step. I plan on doing some testing with mine, and I have the capability to laser etch, so I've opted to intentionally over-engineer some areas or add certain features, but you can skip these, and I don't anticipate you'll miss anything. So far, we cut pairs of every piece, so what we're going to do next is glue these pairs together to create one panel that's now half an inch thick. You can actually eliminate this step by using half inch thick material to begin with. This way you'll only have to cut one of everything. But I chose to use quarter inch because it's both easier to cut, easier to source, and I opted to sandwich these threaded weld nuts in between the two layers. This is what the 3D etched recesses were for. Again, this step is completely optional. You could just drill or laser a straight eight millimeter hole and eliminate the recesses and the weld nuts altogether. I imagine that would work just fine. I plan on testing the limits of this prototype, and I felt these threaded inserts might prevent the acrylic from stress cracking along the axle holes, but this is optional and probably unnecessary, especially if you're using almost anything other than acrylic, which is highly prone to cracking. Another problem with acrylic is that it's mostly coming from China these days, and while it's commonly advertised as quarter inch thick, in reality it's a little short at only 5 millimeters. And this turned out to be an issue because the final panel thickness after being glued will need to be exactly half an inch thick for this design to work. I solved this problem by cutting and sandwiching in an additional 16th inch layer of acrylic, but in hindsight, because of both the cracking issues and the thickness not being a true quarter inch, I probably should have used something like MDF, plywood, or PVC. All of these materials are available in half an inch thick, so I could have avoided half the cutting, all of the gluing, as well as the engraved recesses and the weld nuts. However you choose to do it, you're going to end up with five half-inch thick panels. And it's that simple. We're almost ready to start assembling. We only need to deal with a couple more issues. First is the motor mount. The Snowcat used a custom bracket machined from aluminum, but we're going to use the same laser-cut scrap material we used for the frame. But this time, we're going to continue to stack the pieces until it measures an inch and a half thick. For motors, you have countless options, but I'm going to use two of these 6374 electric skateboard motors. These are cheap, readily available, and most importantly, they're fast. A Russian T-14 tank has an average cruising speed of about 40 miles per hour. And with two of these motors installed, with the right power, we should be able to reach over 50 miles an hour and easily outrun any Russian tank being hunted. Using the trim saw attachment and a silicon carbide blade on the gumball, 
I'm going to cut a 12 centimeter piece off of this 8 millimeter threaded rod. And I'm going to connect it to the motor using this coupling. And just like that, we're ready to start assembling. First thing you're going to do is attach the motor to the mounting bracket, and they both get attached to the side panels using four M4 bolts. You're going to do this with one motor on each of the two side panels. Once the motors are connected, you assemble the frame similar to a Lego set. We're going to start by laying down the base. Each panel has a mortise that allows it to lock into its appropriate place. And just like that, we're done. The frame's assembled. Wasn't that easy? Next, we're going to take three M8 by 500 millimeter threaded rods, and we're going to run them through each axle hole in the frame. I'm going to use this cordless drill to help speed up the process, but if you took my advice and eliminated the threaded weld nuts, then you can just push the rods through by hand. As you're passing the rods through, you're going to add six of these nuts, one for each side of each panel. When you're done, it's going to look something like this. The final threaded rod is going to feed through this slot. The purpose of this slot is to allow the tension for the tracks to be adjustable. As you're feeding through the final threaded rod, you're going to add two of these 8 millimeter couplings. You're then going to feed M4 bolts through these holes in the front, and they're going to get screwed into the two couplings. And when you're done, it should look like this. Here's the top. It was laser cut from quarter inch acrylic, but you can use 1 8 if you want. The placement for all of the screw holes has already been lasered in, so you can use the top as a guide. And with the micro motor attachment on the gumball, I'm going to drill the holes into the frame. All we have left now are the wheels and the tracks. But first, I'm going to install a bearing here to act as a support. Keeping with the easily accessible theme, I've chosen to use skateboard bearings, which can be found in almost every home. For the wheels, I'm going to start by laser cutting these gears. And I know I said that I wanted to avoid 3D printing, but since this is a prototype, I'm going to 3D print a few parts just for the wheels, but I do have a solution that would eliminate the need for 3D printing if I wanted to make a lot of these. I'll show you that in a minute, but first let me finish the prototype using 3D printed parts to make sure everything fits properly and my measurements are correct. Here I'm installing more of these skateboard bearings on each side of the wheels. And this final wheel is a combination of laser cut gears that get screwed onto these 3D printed end caps. And once we screw those together, the wheels are finished. We can install them onto the frame, and the only thing left now are the tracks. The Snowcat used a hundred of these custom injection molded track links that require an expensive die to manufacture and hours of assembly time screwing them together. If we're trying to get cost and manufacturing time down as low as possible, then these tracks gotta go. Sticking with the only salvaged materials theme of the build, I decided to use car tires. These are cheap and easily available at any junkyard. I started with two of these 165-70R12 tires. I chose this brand because the tracks that ran through the pre-existing tread pattern would help act as a guide for drilling the holes, which would be the next step. But first, we need to cut off the sidewalls. To do this, I used the surgical scalpel and just cut along this line on both sides of the tire until the treaded center section was free. Next, using this laser cut pattern, I marked the placement for the holes using the micro motor attachment on the gumball. Next, it's just a matter of drilling out the holes, which turned out to be a lot easier said than done. Little did I know when I started this process, drilling out clean circular holes in tire rubber is a nightmare. Not only is tire rubber incredibly durable and difficult to drill, it's also reinforced with steel, which makes this process much harder than I imagined. I tested almost every drill bit type on the market with no luck, and I was almost ready to give up when I came across a tutorial related to, I think, repairing flat tires, where they suggest using something called a tire reaming bit that's supposed to work really well. The problem is that the only bits I was able to find that were large enough with decent reviews were like a hundred bucks each. This project was supposed to be cheap, 
So I really didn't want to spend that much for a single drill bit. So after a little more searching, I came across these carbide angle grinder bits that looked very similar to the tire reaming bits, and they were only about 10 bucks each. So I figured I'd give them a try, and they actually worked really well. If I was going to do this again, or if I wanted to make several of these, I think I would spend some time researching an alternative. Maybe some sort of friction drive that would eliminate the need for drilling all of these holes. Because the rest of the assembly and fabrication is a breeze. Anyone could easily put one of these together in a single afternoon. The bottleneck with this design, what takes the most time and effort, are these holes. If we can eliminate those, smooth sailing. I have some ideas I plan on testing, and if it works, I'll share it in a future video. But for now, we'll stick to these. And I have just one more thing to do before we can put the tracks on. Here I cut two of these panels from the same quarter inch acrylic and using a soldering iron I'm going to melt in a bunch of these threaded inserts using the laser cut holes as a guide. I'm going to fuse these panels to the top using a powerful solvent called methylene chloride. What this does is temporarily melts the surface of the acrylic and while it's melted you can fuse it to another piece of acrylic and after it dries it forms a permanent and nearly indestructible bond. The purpose of these panels is to function as a fixture plate that will allow easy attachment of anything from cameras, sensors, antennas, solar panels, guns, explosives. There are so many possible uses for this little mobile platform, I couldn't possibly get into all of them in just one video. So next I'm going to mount the tracks and by tightening these nuts in the front I'll be able to adjust the tracks to the correct tension. One alternative for 3D printed wheels I'm experimenting with is to instead 3D print this two-part mold that I can use to cast the wheels using liquid casting foam. This will allow me to cast one wheel every few minutes, which is a lot faster and cheaper than 3D printing them, but another benefit is that these wheels will be soft and will hopefully provide a little bit of extra suspension as well. Anyway, I'm going to assemble the other side now and I need to do the electronics, but I think I'm going to end the video here. Once I have it fully assembled, I'll make another video where I demonstrate its use and talk a little more about how I imagine it being used. So I think that'll do it for now. Please consider subscribing. And to any of the backers who've donated to the Everything Machine, if you want to build one of these, shoot me an email and I'll send you over all the files. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.